Hey everyone, welcome to the Sunday You Summit. My name is Justin Dean. I'm the founder of SundayU.com and we are a training resource site for churches and church leaders. Basically provide everything you need to help you do your job better, whether it's helping to run Sunday mornings or engaging with people from uh, week to week, from Sunday to Sunday. Uh, we have resources, documents, templates, social media images, and a huge catalog of training videos and courses uh, to help you do your job better. And you can find all of that at SundayU.com. Today we've got an awesome summit for you. We're bringing you all of this content uh, for free. and We've got some great speakers lined up to give you a taste of what you get when you're a Sunday U member. Today we've got uh, Mark McDonald, who is the GOAT when it comes to church communications training. The guy's got uh, over 35 years of marketing experience in the church, and he's going to share some practical tips with you today. We've got Liz Barrett Baker, uh, Marcy Carrico, Pastor Chris Pratt, uh, not the dinosaur guy actor, but Pastor Chris Pratt guy is uh, amazing, and Dan Ermler and Rob Lauder from the Summit Church. So we're bringing, the, bringing you all these uh, videos, all this training to you today free. And uh, we're going to play them just back to back. And then we'll actually replay this summit uh, today for free as well. So you can really take advantage of this content and uh, give you a taste of some of the training that's available inside at SundayU.com. And today really the focus is on maintaining balance in an unbalanced world. And we all know, I, I think we can all agree that the world right now is a little unbalanced, particularly when it comes to uh, political division within the church and, and among Christians and just how everyone's either on one side or the other. It's really extreme. There's really no uh, middle ground. It's, it's really hard to find common ground with people even when, when having discussions and um, that can make things really difficult when it comes to trying to do ministry and try to, to love people and try to win people over for Christ and try to grow our churches and, and tell people about our churches and our services and programs and everything that we've got going on and even just engaging people particularly on social media has become uh, quite the nightmare lately and we know that as you know church communicators and marketers and people working in the church you can get overwhelmed you can get burnt out pretty easily and uh, there's just a ton of work to do, and that's hard to, to manage and keep balanced. It's hard to uh, keep things organized and on track. It's hard to keep up with the demands of you know our senior leaders and our pastors and um, just their big visions for trying to grow the church you know fast and rapidly and uh, trying to keep up with uh, everything in culture and needing to engage with everything that's that's relevant in the moment, but still trying to just do the regular tasks from day to day that keep the church uh, alive and going and making sure that people are still uh, donating and giving to their church and that people are still growing as disciples and, and caring for them. It's just, it's a lot, right? I, I know that uh, you can... Um, you can relate to this uh, on some level at least. And so that's our focus today in these sessions is just to help equip you and uh, and train you and just be there with you as we collaborate on this and, and figure this out together on, on how to maintain balance in an unbalanced world. And so uh, these six speakers are, are going to speak specifically on that. Um, and this is just one topic that we have uh, in SundayU.com. Um, you can find all kinds of, of training materials, everything from how to run Facebook ads to what should be on your website to uh, you know production training for for Sunday morning to you know tons of content on social media and marketing and just communications re related uh, topics as well. And uh, so hopefully this gives you a good taste. Hope you enjoy this content. We're, we're bringing it to you for free. Please, you know, share this page uh, with your friends on social media and, and all your colleagues and, you know, post it in the Facebook groups because we, we want to share this content and we think it's timely right now. We, we hope that it's helpful uh, for churches and I uh, hope you really, really enjoy it. 
And uh, if you do want to become uh, a member of uh, SundayU, uh, dot com. After you see this content, and you think, man, well, I, I could use a lot more um, of content like this, or even some of our downloadable templates and things that just help you make your your job easier. Like that's what we're here for. Um, we provide coaching and and things like that as well. Um, I want you to be able to try the site and get access to all of this. So we're actually giving away uh, the first month free. So if you go to sundayu.com and sign up and enroll, um, you can use the coupon code SUMMIT, and that will get you your first month uh, free. You can go ahead and try it out. If you don't like it, then you can cancel. Um, and uh, we'd love your feedback on ways that we can make it better if that's the case. But I think once you get inside, you're going to really enjoy uh, all the content and resources we have. It's only $29 uh, a month to join. And again, you can get your first month free just by using the code SUMMIT. So we're going to jump right into the content and uh, go back to back here with these sessions. And then again, we'll, we'll replay them as well. Um, so we're going to start off things with uh, Mr. Mark McDonald. So here we go. Thanks for joining us. It seems that being busy is the new virtue signal of... Our generation of virtue signalers. Virtue signaling is it's saying something so that you feel special and a bit above those around you. So you somehow feel better about yourself or use it to convince others that you are better. Like a camouflage so people don't know the real you. They just know the cape of virtue that you want them to know. So when they ask, hey, how are you doing? You say, oh, you know, I'm so incredibly busy. Work has filled every waking hour. I'm that important. I'm that needed. But is that what God wants for us? I don't think we're supposed to virtue signal at all. Let's be known for being authentic, genuine, and real. What we say is what we are. Now that's true Christianity. And I want to be that. Now can I be real with you for a moment? As a creative, we tend to not want to reveal the core of who we are. So we regularly blame busyness for our downfall. And why is that? Because often as creatives, we're required to create something out of seemingly nothing in not a lot of time. You know, it's, it's really scary. And, and then on top of that, man, this is really transparent. We love to procrastinate. Many times we haven't even started the things that are due in the next few moments. On top of that, we can't we can't possibly look weak or people will question the value of our ideas or our value. If you don't know me, I'm Mark McDonald. I'm a Canadian-born American who was senior creative director at one of Eastern Canada's largest ad agencies. And now I run Be Known for Something, a church branding agency in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm also executive director of Center for Church Communication, and I've written the best-selling church branding book, Be Known for Something, as well as more than 800 church communication strategy articles. With all of those things going on, I know what it feels like to be busy. So how do we balance our chaos within this regiment of living within other people's boundaries. It often feels so unbalanced. It seems that the processes of life have created shelves, parallel straight planes that seem to be built to house everything in our lives. A shelf for God, a shelf for family, a shelf for work, a shelf for you. A shelf for evangelism, a shelf for, well, fill in the blank. As your to-do list gets longer and longer, you place things on the shelves. Sure, you try to keep everything, you know, somewhat organized so that you can identify what's there. But if I could look through this screen and see your desk, 
or your computer desktop, we're also creative. So we tend to let our shelves fill up randomly as we set things down. When someone asks, how are you doing? We often know how full the shelves are and we quickly say, oh man, my, my life is busy. If you have to find something, you somehow know where it is, well, to an extent. And since leaders know that if you want to get something done, you need to give it to someone who's busy. So they hand you projects and you have to clear a space for one more thing. Often the shelves become so cluttered that it's just hard to fit anything more onto the shelf. Life starts to feel out of control, out of, out of balance as the urgent takes over for the shelf's priority and the important gets pushed to the back. Oh, you're aware of those critical things even though you can't see them anymore. And just as you feel the pressure of all the things weighing down on the front of your shelves, your life feels like it's at a tipping point. You keep telling people how busy you are. You keep getting more and more things to be done, all while neglecting foundational projects. Then, of course, your car breaks down, the kids get sick, the unchurched neighbor asks if you can do something to help them. Man, what a great evangelism opportunity. But the unbalanced life that you're living leads you to say, I'm sorry, I just can't right now. I'm busy. Many times I think God has tried to heap onto us all of those things, you know, the exceedingly more abundant above all that we could ever ask or think. And we don't have the shelf room for those blessings. That's just messed up. Our out of balance life keeps us from so much. What I've found in my 35 years of being a creative director, author, church communication writer, church branding agency leader, a speaker, and yes, busy person who's now a grandfather, still a dad of two grown sons and a husband of 32 years, you know what I've discovered? I've stopped telling people I'm busy. And I do whatever I can to keep the shelf of my life balanced. So, are you ready for the solution that solved a lot for me? I keep an empty shelf. Some of you know I've been a national commercial model for businesses like Lowe's, Ford, Cars, Tommy Hilfiger, Toyota, John Deere, Tractor Supply, and others. And I have a confession. In order to have an agent book my modeling gigs for me, I always have to be ready for the booking. Ready with my time and ready with my wardrobe. It's very rare that clothes are ever supplied for a commercial shoot. And the requirements for wardrobes, I mean, can sometimes just be crazy. The color, the style, the fit, and nothing can be branded. No logos or anything that makes the outfit recognizable as a brand. Well, of course, unless it's the shoot is for the brand name, and then they usually supply all the clothes. So to be ready, I have to buy a ton of clothes ahead of time to stock my closet for that potential wardrobe. Okay, to be honest, it's just an extra spare closet that I pack with everything I could possibly use for shoots. After modeling for 20 years, I have a lot of clothes. So you know what my wife's mantra is? If you buy something to add, you better subtract equal amounts. And that's difficult. But it's required because I only have a certain amount of space available. Often, after a successful shopping spree, I try to jam the clothes into the already stuffed hanging clothes. Okay, 
<laughs> Again, I have to say it. I have a lot of clothes. And I have all of those favorites with, well, intermingled in all of my clothes. But oftentimes the favorites rise to the front and then the back gets jammed with clothes that I just never use. <laughs> Maybe you know the feeling and you're not even a professional model. When we moved to Florida five years ago, we just had less closet space here. So I finally eliminated things that I hadn't worn much. Oh, and it's embarrassing to even admit, but some of the things still had their tags on it. But it gave me an empty shelf and allows me to organize better. And I don't panic when I'm tempted by a clothing sale that lets me purchase something more that I think I need. Do you want more balance? Want to feel more organized and more creative? Get an empty shelf. No, clear an empty shelf. You only have a certain amount of time available to you, so set the boundaries. Get rid of things in your life that really aren't needed or aren't good for you. Allow space in your schedule for the unexpected blessing to be heaped onto you or for the you time that you know you desperately need. Many of you, th many of you need the space just to rediscover your quiet time that feeds your soul and allows you to listen to God again. Clear the necessary space to allow for room to expand and expand beyond anything you could ever ask or think. I know it's tough to do though, but it needs to be done. And as the empty shelf fills up, you need to listen to my wife. As you add, you must subtract. Here's what my three decades of living a seemingly unbalanced life has taught me. But really, these four things come from the last decade of keeping the shelf clear. Number one, know your thread. Uh, often it's difficult to know which shelf to clear off. You're incredibly talented. That's why you're busy and unbalanced. So realize that you can't do it all. Pray about the talents that you're really good at. Concentrate on those things and get really great at them. Narrow them down to a thread that you can become known for. If you're feeling unbalanced, it's often because you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. Be known for being great with a limited amount of talents. Two, identify tasks that can be given to others. If someone is willing, use them. If they need training, train them or get the training for them. Develop work friends who often will challenge you to get better all while taking things off of your plate or should I say, taking things off of your shelf. I've discovered that the feeling of being unbalanced comes from times when I feel like I'm working alone. So create a tribe that you can help clear your shelf. And you don't have to do that with a huge budget. In ministry, you need to be activating a team of volunteers who are passionate and talented. Stop being known for doing it all alone. Three, you need a friend. Life is tough, challenging, and unbalanced, and God never intended us to be doing it alone. That's why the local church is to be known for fellowship, and you can have fellowship even if you work there. Seek out someone who understands you truly. Someone who can challenge you and keep you accountable for keeping that shelf clear. You know, many times that unbalanced life that you're feeling comes not, um, not having a safe space to air who you are and, and have an honest sounding board from a genuine friend. Now, I'd recommend someone, though, outside of your church or workspace 
someone who can see the forest that you're working in, but not know all of the trees. Four, finally, take a Sabbath. <laughs> Imagine God said, sure, you have seven shelves in your life, but leave one empty. Let me fill it with opportunities and rest. <laughs> you need it. Oh, and that unbalanced feeling, I've discovered that it floods and overwhelms your life when you don't have a way to disconnect with time for nothing. Be known for booking and protecting time on your calendar that isn't assigned for anything. When you get to it in your agenda and you don't know what to do with it, wouldn't that be wonderful? Well, start talking with God and reading his word. And then once he's fed you, consider reaching out to encourage others. Take them for coffee, pray with them, or ask them if you can help them with anything. Be known for having the time to encourage. It'll make you a better leader. See, creativity requires empty space. You need an empty shelf. So clear a shelf. Allow empty time away from social media, from email, from notifications, from Netflix. Take a walk without your phone. Sit on the beach. Watch the waves. Open the Bible again with no agenda. No sermon series to prepare for. Just a time to spend with a friend. A friend who wants you to be ready for all the good he has for you and the space to receive it. So do you want a reminder that you can frame for your office? You know, when you subscribe to my communication encouragement email at beknownforsomething.com slash subscribe, again, beknownforsomething.com slash subscribe, I'll send you a free... PDF that you can print and frame. Creativity requires an empty shelf. So go to be known for something.com slash subscribe and make sure you select Sunday you and I will send you this today for free. Let it be a reminder every time that you see it. Creativity requires an empty shelf. Be known for your empty shelf. Be known for being ready for the unexpected, for God's blessings and opportunities. I hope you'll follow along with me as I try to keep my shelf cleared. Follow me on most social media channels at markmac1023. And make sure you get my weekly email tips. And that's available at beknownforsomething.com slash subscribe. And I'll also throw in that PDF of the empty shelf. Go, discover your thread, and clear a shelf. Be known for balance. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think with me about uh, the Olympics. We're watching the Olympics and we happen to be watching, since we're talking about balance, we happen to be watching an Olympic athlete that is up on a balance beam, okay? And we're talking about how amazing uh, they are with their flexibility. They're so nimble, they are strong, they're powerful, they have grace and they have balance and it's it's just like awe-inspiring. So the reason I want you to think about that imagery is because obviously we all know <laughs> that that person, that that Olympic athlete didn't just become a balance expert, right? They didn't just figure that out like one day wake up and they could be an Olympic athlete competing on the balance beam. They spent years cultivating habits that led to their success as an Olympic athlete. 
me standing here saying, hey, by the way, in order to balance your life, you're going to have to do more work. I know that sounds awful, <laughs> but bear with me. Because again, this is just a reminder that first of all, it does take effort and intentionality. And that this is God's design that we should live lives that are focused on him and that are lived in a wise way. And I'm absolutely convinced that wise living equals balanced living. When we've got our eyes focused on God, we're going to live more balanced lives. We're not going to get it right all the time. And guess what? Neither does the athlete. The athlete falls. The athlete stumbles, especially at the beginning, but not just at the beginning. And guess what they do? They get back up. They talk to their coach. They get more rest. If they hurt themselves, they go to the doctor and they take care of it and they just get up and they keep working towards that that balance. And that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to give you what I think is a really helpful <laughs> step in the right direction because we can talk about all of the many ways that we could try to achieve balance. But if we were to take each one of those, that's just overwhelming. <laughs> but there's one thing that we can do today that is going to help all of those areas of life. I probably need to introduce myself. My name is Liz Baker and I'm a consultant and strategist. I just spent the last four years on staff at two different churches as the director of communications. And now I'm out on my own doing consulting and strategy. And one of the things I'm super passionate about this year in 2022 is church growth post pandemic. And I, I think I've got some really excellent ideas of how to help churches. So uh, you can look me up at nimbology.com. In John 16, 33, Jesus literally tells us that in this world, we will have trouble, but to take hope because he has overcome the world. I don't want to get into the individual challenges. We know that they're going to come, that they're going to be different for each of us. But again, the solution to maintaining balance in the midst of any challenge remains the same. <laughs> okay. So again, hang with me because this one thing that we're going to do is going to make all the difference in how you handle even the toughest challenges and the simple challenges too. So just as the, the Olympic athlete trains so that they can perform with excellence, even under the pressure of being in the Olympics, what can we do as Christians, to prepare ourselves, to build ourselves up, to to prepare for living life under high pressure situations, under challenges, under crazy conditions sometimes. Proverbs 2, 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom, from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And God wants to give us the wisdom. He says in James that if any of you lacks wisdom, then he should ask for it and God will give it to him freely. In order to live this balanced life, it starts with God. And why would I tell an entire group of people who already know God to start with God? Because after talking with Christian coworkers and family members and friends, I have realized that we don't start our days. Now, again, this might not be you, but a lot of people who know God personally do not seek his wisdom to begin their days. And I'm going to give you a strategy for doing this that literally can transform your life starting today. And that is, <laughs> bear with me, starting your morning by reading the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> just be that sounds like the most obvious answer on the planet. I get it. I know that you are thinking why this is the, the most ridiculous thing, but it's not. It's actually really a beautiful way to start your day. None of this information that I'm telling you is new or an original idea. It's stuff I've picked up from commentaries and books and just through reading the prayer over the years. And one book in particular was written by a former pastor of mine, Dr. Ken Hemphill, and he wrote The Prayer of Jesus. And one of the things that really stood out to me and that really changed the way that I looked at that prayer was the first word. 
our father makes me think about all of the people who are in the Jesus family with me and that I am not alone in this and that we are together and that there is a bigger picture than just Liz alone or you alone. He is not an impersonal God, but he is literally asking us to call him dad, our father in heaven. When you say in heaven, you are literally remembering first thing in the morning that our focus has to be beyond the physical and what we see and touch. We know that there's a spiritual realm. And when you say first thing in the morning, our father in heaven, you realize that there's more to this life than this physical world that we're living in. So it's a great way to ground ourselves <laughs> in a heavenly way first thing in the morning. So our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. When you remember hallowed, which I, I've gone back and forth whether or not I love that word or don't like that word. And really, it's because the reasons I would say that I don't like it are because nobody uses it anymore. And so it's kind of lost its understanding in our culture. But so if you look it up, it just means honored and revered. And so when we talk about God, we want your name to be hallowed. We want it to be honored and revered. Then again, first thing in the morning, we're thinking about our part in that. That means that you're going to act in such a way today that is going to increase his renown, not decrease it. You're going to want to, to act in such a way that, that is holy, that is good. Again, when you start your day wanting God's will, not yours, but, but wanting God's will and a willingness to see the world through God's eyes and to help be part of that plan to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, that changes the trajectory of your day and it changes your priorities and all of these things work together. And I'll tell you in a minute <laughs> why. When you're thinking about what your priorities are, they're not your priorities. Your priority is is God and his kingdom and how it be his name and helping his kingdom to come in the midst of being a, a parent, a friend, a family member, a co-worker, a neighbor. Hang on. Give us this day our daily bread goes back to the same concept of our that when you pray this, you're recognizing that you have specific needs that need to be met today. You need to be fed, but it's not just about you. It's other people in the world, in your community and across the globe also need to be fed. And so it helps keep you grounded and it helps keep you thinking beyond yourself and to the needs of other people who also need Jesus, who also need God's provision. Don't you think this will help you to keep your mind on the things that are important to God and keep your mind, oh man, isn't it just so much better? <laughs> Don't you feel, I hadn't thought about this before, but you know what's out of balance? When we are so focused on self instead of being focused on others, and that's one of the beauties of the Lord's Prayer is that this helps you immediately to remember that it's not just about you. Oh man, and I'm about to go to the next part, which really is gonna help <laughs> with this, right? Because it's out of balance to just think of me, me, me. I mean, again, we're supposed to be loving God and loving others as ourself. So we are supposed to love ourselves and that is part of maintaining balance because if you're not loving yourself, then you are out of balance. So you do need to love yourself. Okay, so this next part, love it. Forgive us our sins, which we are all going to sin today. We are all going to be in need of grace. We're going to miss opportunities. This, again, does not give us the, the license to sin. It's just a recognition that we're going to get it wrong sometimes, not intentionally, and sometimes intentionally. And God, we're going to need your grace. We're going to need your grace. And then as we forgive those who sin against us, you're starting your day by remembering that you need grace 
and then remembering that you need to extend grace. How differently would we live our lives in relation to others if every single day, the beginning of the day, everyone was reminded that we're not going to get it right, they're not going to get it right, and we're going to forgive each other. <laughs> That's transformative. And again, it's out of balance if we don't forgive ourselves, if we don't forgive others, if we harbor bitterness, if we don't recognize the sin in our lives, if we don't recognize that we need God, that we need his grace, that we're in need of a savior. That's not bad. That's the reality. That's not judgment. That is, that is good news. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The same temptations that existed back at the beginning of humanity still exist today. And those are everything from jealousy and greed and uh, sexual impurity and focus on self instead of others and trusting our own wisdom or the wisdom of other people over the wisdom of God. Those are temptations that we face every single day. We're asking God, hey, as I begin this day, I recognize that I'm going to face temptations and I want you to deliver me from those and deliver me from evil. And let me tell you a quick story about this. So like several years ago, uh, when my, my kids were really little, I was having this time of like really, I was very anxious. I went to my doctor and I said, hey doc, I'm very anxious. What am I gonna do about it? And he started asking me these questions. Like, are you sleeping at night? Are you eating? You know, boom, boom, boom. Goes down this list of like 10 questions. And he says, hey, you know, on a scale of like one to 10, one being the lowest anxiety, 10 being the highest anxiety, I give you a, and I braced myself because I was like, it's gonna be huge. And he goes, I put you at a two. And I was like, okay, I am feeling super anxious and I do not understand why you just put me at a two. And he said, well, you're, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're doing all the normal stuff you're supposed to do. I know it's uncomfortable for you, but really, you really actually have the impact of the anxiety on your life is actually very low, as uncomfortable as it feels. And then he went on to explain that because he's a doctor, lots of people come into his office and trust him with their life secrets. And he said, Liz, <laughs> there are people who come in and every single day who have succumbed to temptation of all kinds. They're embezzling, they're stealing, they're, they're ruining relationships in their family, they're, they're cheating on their spouses, all these things that they have, have um, succumbed to all this pressure and temptation. And he said, those people, they can't sleep, they can't eat, it's really impacting their lives and they have tons of anxiety. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm definitely not suggesting that everybody with high anxiety is dealing with uh, the results of, uh, you, that they have succumbed to temptation. That's not it at all. I'm just saying that if you do succumb to temptation and you do get trapped in something that some sin in your life, talk about a lack of balance. Those things get us so out of balance. And so we need to flee temptation. And God says he promises that he gives us the wisdom and the resources to get out of a situation so that we don't choose poorly, choose unwisely, and then end up completely out of balance because we are in sin up to our neck. <laughs> and so as you face those temptations, it's really important to love, but to love yourself, to love God and love others by saying no, no to those. And it's so funny how we, again, listen to ourselves and say, well, yeah, but this looks really good, or I'd really like to do this. And did God really, does he really mean that this is going to be? Yes, he does. And we can trust that. And the fact is that as I'm saying this to you right now, you know, you know that that's the truth. You know those things that are temptations that lead to unwise behavior that are going to lead to a massive unbalance in your life. So don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. You remember I told you at the beginning that we can't go into all of the ways that we have to balance our lives because it's just too much and it's too overwhelming. We don't have to worry about those things. 
because the Bible says to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be added to you. The balance will come when we start our days and live our days focused on the kingdom. When we live our lives with Jesus, while we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, these truths are trustworthy and transformative. They literally have the ability to change your life, the life of your family, the life of your neighbors, community, co-workers. And this is how Jesus literally told us to pray. I don't want you to hear me saying this is the only thing we should pray. I'm just saying it's a foundational prayer that Jesus gave us for a reason. And it deserves our attention. And then pray about all things. Pray at all times. So once we start this conversation, pray. If you want to, if after you say the Lord's Prayer, and you don't, listen, you don't have to do this. If there's another way that you want to pray, pray. Just pray. But Pray that God will help you to remember to, to keep the connection open with him all day, that you won't try to do it on your own, and that God will remind you throughout the day to prompt you to seek him for wisdom in conversations, at work, in the way that you parent, in your interactions with your neighbors. If you're not already praying in the morning, give it a shot. Start praying. And I think you're going to have some stories to tell me immediately about the ways that God transformed your day because you started with him and then he prompted you to continue that spirit of prayer throughout the day. All things have the potential to get out of balance, but all things have the potential to get back in balance when we seek his kingdom first, first thing in the morning, first thing when we do anything. <laughs> He has the potential to transform our lives with his wisdom in the most amazing ways. God bless you as you continue to, to seek and maintain balance to God's glory in your lives. Be blessed. Bless others. Talk to you soon. Hey guys, hope you are enjoying this free content. Wanted to just jump back in and, uh, Make sure you're doing good and uh, want to encourage you to share this summit on social media so we can reach as many people as possible with this free content. We think it's very timely uh, right now for everything that's going on in the world and just how uh, it is to do ministry uh, in the world right now. So hopefully uh, you're getting some practical uh, advice from these sessions. Uh, we've got Marcy uh, Carrico coming up, Chris Pratt, uh, Dan Ermler. And we're going to round things off today with Rob Lauder. Uh, great content coming your way. And we're all we're providing it to you all uh, free uh, today. And uh, we'll replay this again uh, once today. And then, uh, of course, you can get access to it at SundayU.com if you become a member. And uh, I really want you to just try it out. Try SundayU if you're not already a member. Uh, you can get your first month free by using that coupon code SUMMIT. And I hope you'll... Uh, give it a try there you can cancel anytime it's very easy um, and uh, you know you can you can sign up now get that free month and then switch over your billing to a, a church card if you need to just want to make sure you you're taking advantage uh, of this offer uh, you do need to enroll by June 3rd in order to get uh, that first month free using the coupon code summit so hope you can go do that now at sundayu.com and uh, sign up for that and you can uh, just click a, above here and uh, enroll now and then come back um, to the summit as well and watch these videos. But uh, we're going to jump right back into it. We've got Marcy uh, coming up next. And uh, again, share, share this on social media. And uh, we hope you enjoy it. We hope it's been a blessing to you. Thank you for watching. Well, hey, that church summit. My name is Marcy Carrico, and I am so excited about this topic of maintaining balance in an unbalanced world. You know, I think we can all agree that this world is a little unbalanced. I mean, you can't even have an opinion about your favorite chicken sandwich without causing some type of disturbance. 
but I'm here to talk to you today about a subject that is really near and dear to my heart, and that is maintain, maintaining balance in work and in your personal life. You know, I think most of you watching are probably on staff at a church or you're a high capacity volunteer. And with that, you get the unique opportunity of carrying the message of Christ. Whether you're a lead pastor and you're sharing that message from the stage, or you serve in communications and you get to share the message of Christ on digital platforms. Whatever that looks like in your role, you get that opportunity. And I wanna pause for a minute and just say thank you. Thank you so much for what you do. I know that there are things that you're doing behind the scenes that no one ever sees or hears about. I know that because I work here for Sunday U and I get to coach so many of you in different aspects of your job and I hear your stories and I hear the things that your congregations sometimes don't hear and wow, I'm just amazed by all you do and I'm just thankful for you. So thank you so much for what you do. But I think also what I've seen by talking to so many of you, and quite frankly, by living this. I used to be on staff at a church, and now I'm a volunteer at our family's church. I have seen people overwork. Um, we justify it. We justify overworking. People need us. People need us to show them the love of Jesus. So we keep going. We press on towards the goal. We don't get tired of doing what is good. We use scripture to justify this. And um, and I think eventually we get worn out. That this can lead to burnout. And actually I'm about to share a very personal story from something that happened to our family. Um, I was on staff at a church and I was using a program to produce the bulletin. That was one of my responsibilities. And the program I was using was someone that, a program that no one else knew how to use it. So I had kind of locked myself into being the only person who could do our bulletin. And um, then I got a call that my son was in the, in the emergency room three hours away. It was bulletin printing day. So um, that was a tough time. And that's not a great way to do ministry. So what are you gonna do? I'm gonna to talk to you from two perspectives and I'm also gonna to talk to you about scalability and building teams. The first thing I wanna address is, front, I wanna address the people who are on staff. Um, so often when we talk about equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, we only think of pastors doing that. But I think that needs to apply to anyone who's on a church staff or in any leadership position in the church. Um, if you are on staff at a church or in a leadership position at all, then you need to be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Let's scale that and talk about what that looks like on a practical level. At our church, I'm a volunteer. Um, I have offered to volunteer in the area of communications. I'm sure you're shocked. So the staff member, who was doing the website is now allowing me to do the website. He had to equip me to do the website. That meant he had to give me a login and, and, and a password to the website. I am also helping with social media and helping with, um, I'm hosting our church online on Sundays. With all of those, I had to be equipped and given access to those things. You can take this, you can scale this to any ministry. If you are on your facilities team and your role is to unlock the building every day, find another person who can unlock the building. What that does is that frees you to invest in other people it means you're investing in another person, but it also means if you do have an emergency, if you have a child who ends up in the emergency room, if you have your own medical emergency, someone else can do what you do. You're not locked in to doing what you do. So I'll keep taking this back to where I am now so that you can see that I'm kind of walking through this with you. So I was given some pretty liberal access to our social media 
and to our website and our church online. But along with equipping, what you want to do as a staff member is empower people. So that means that you have equipped them to do it, but you're also empowering them to not have to come back to you with every question. They don't have to come back to you with every, everything. Practically, what that looks like at our church is I've been given a login to our website, and I've also been empowered to make some decisions about what goes on the website. Um, I do have staff oversight in that, so I'm not just making decisions without any, without anyone overseeing that. They are definitely not unilateral decisions, but I do have some authority in, in what goes on and I can, can do that with, within boundaries. Make sure that as you're equipping and empowering people, that you are establishing the boundaries for them so that, so that they know this is what I need to do. This is where I can go. This is kind of give them the sandbox to play in and then let them play in it. Okay. So, and, and this is scalable to any level. This, we, my family and I were at a church. The lead pastor himself had a family emergency and was able to call one of his elders and say, you're preaching this week. So obviously they had to go a little bit off what their current topic was outside of the boundaries of their, or outside of their current sermon series. But every elder, I, I found out later, that every elder in that church had a ready-made sermon to preach, like in case of emergency. So when you're talking about equipping and empowering, you can do this at every level of ministry, from your lead pastor, everywhere. If you are in office staff at a church, begin to bring in weekday office volunteers to help you in the office. Uh, let somebody see how and when to send the weekly email. Where does that information come from? Um, show someone else how to get the mail. Show someone else how to answer the phones. The day's going to come that you're going to want to take a vacation and the ministry still has to go on. So begin to equip and empower people to do the work of the ministry. I want to address this now from a congregational level. If you are not serving at your church, you need to step up. God has given us gifts and he's called us to use those gifts. One of the areas that I get to coach people in is I get to coach, well, I get to coach a lot of people at the church staff level who are not at the pastoral level, but they are in other roles on church staff. And one of the common things that I hear when I talk to them about setting up a team or team building or leading a team is um, they feel a lot of guilt. I had one person say to me, well, isn't that what they pay me to do? Yes and no. If we, if we begin to look at this, that every person on the church staff or every leader, whether staff or volunteer, is called to equip and empower the saints or to equip the saints to the work of the ministry, then I had to tell her, no, that's not what they pay you to do. They pay you for the time that you're dedicating to lead. Um, and I think that other people on church staff have told me that they hear those words from their congregation, that when they, when they ask for help, when they try to establish a team or ask, ask for help, that the feedback they get from their congregations is their congregations might say, isn't that what we pay you to do? That breaks my heart when I hear people say that their congregations have said that to them because as congregations, we need to realize that that is not what we're paying people to do. We are paying them for the hours that they're dedicating to ministry and we, were, we are honoring those hours. Now, I also get to coach volunteer teams. This is one of the most fun parts of my job is coaching volunteer teams. And I get to coach volunteer teams. And one of the common things that I hear from the volunteer teams is we're paying 
someone to do the work, which I challenge. And I say, but I'm putting in just as many hours and I'm not getting a paycheck for that. Remember this, as a volunteer, you've already been paid. You've already been given the best thing that you could ever get. And there's no monetary value on this. You've already been given Christ. Jesus, God sent his son to die on the cross for you. You've already been given that. And the way you're serving is out of an overflow from that. So, if you are on staff or in any leadership position at all, you should be building a team. If you are not on your church staff and you are in a leadership position, you should still be building that team. And what I like to tell people when they say, when they say to me, I'm putting in just as many hours, maybe more, and I'm not getting anything from it, build your team. Build your team. Are you investing in other people? You shouldn't be putting in that many hours. So build your team. Begin to break this down. What does this look like on a practical level? Well, as I said, I'm a volunteer for our family's church. And, um, and so I began to realize that I was putting in probably a little more hours than I needed to as a volunteer. And so I did. I broke down um, what I was doing. I was hosting church online. I'm helping with the website and the app. I'm helping with graphic design and I'm helping with social media. Now, because of the job that I have, I'm able to do some of that during the day, but not a lot. So I talked to our family's pastor and I said, let's break this down and let's bring in some other people to help in these different areas. Can I duplicate myself? Probably not. If you're a leader and you're serving in a high capacity, it is very doubtful that you can duplicate yourself. But what you can do is break everything down. Let's say you're a leader and I have the distinct privilege of working someone who is who was a leader in this area. We had a leader who was a facilities leader. He unlocked the building. He did a lot in the way of cleanup and setting up and he was the last person to leave on Sunday and locked up and I said to him find one person find one person who can unlock find one person who can be there to unlock and that person can unlock the building and you can sleep in another 30 minutes and then come in and set up he did a few months later I said Find one person to help make the coffee. Now you've got one person. Now he's a team of three. He's leading. He's got one person who can unlock the door. One person who can make the coffee. And now he's leading two people. And guess what? He got to enjoy service. And then he stayed and cleaned up and locked up. Let's add a fourth person. Someone who can clean up. Let's add a fifth person. Someone who can lock up. Now you've got, you're responsible for the person unlocking, the person setting up, the person cleaning up, and the person locking up. And all of a sudden, this person who had been doing so much, and I was so grateful for him, this person is now leading a team of four people in these four areas. What I'm trying to show you is that what you're, anything you're doing can be scalable. When I broke down our communications team and what I was helping um, at, at my own family's church, I said, let's find one person who can help in this area. Let's find one person who can help with graphic design. Let's find one person who can help host church online. That means one Sunday a month, I'm not hosting church online. Or maybe we can rotate and do every two Sundays. Does it take time to build a team? It 100% takes time. Are you going to be able to duplicate yourself 100%? Probably not. But begin breaking it down and building those teams. And piece by piece, break down everything that you do. And find people to help you in each of those areas. If you are a congregant not serving, look at the people who are serving especially your high capacity leaders 
and go to them and say, how can I help you in one area? What's one thing that I could take off of your plate? It might be minor. It might be unlocking a door. It might be changing the roll of the toilet paper. It might be something so minor, but you could take one thing off of someone's plate and help one person. Listen, ministry is going to go on. No one knows the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back, but we knew, do know that our time on this earth is finite. We're not going to be here forever, and our churches have to go on, and ministry has to go on until the day that Jesus returns. So begin to establish processes, procedures, and things in your ministry that other people can do. Find other people to help you. Begin to equip and empower and invest in other people and equip, empower, and invest in the next generation. And if we do that, we're going to see healthy churches. We're going to see healthy people. We're going to have time to invest in our families. We're going to have time to invest in ourselves. And we're never going to have to wonder if we need to print a bulletin or go see our child in the, in the ER who's three hours away. That's, it's never going to happen because you're going to have someone you can call at any point to say, hey, I've got an emergency. Can you do this? Listen, I love what I get to do. I love that I get to invest in you. I love that I get to coach you. I am here at Sunday U all the time. You can send me a DM. I'd love to chat. And I am praying for you. I am grateful for you. I'm grateful for what you do. I'm grateful for the time that you spend doing it. Thank you so much for watching this talk. And if you need anything, really DM me through Sunday U. DM me through the Churchcom Leaders Group and we will get you into one of our cohorts or I'll spend some time personally coaching you through whatever it is you need. Have a great rest of your day and can't wait to see you online. Bye. Well, hello, my name is Chris Pratt. I'm the lead pastor at Vision Church here in Raleigh, North Carolina. So when I was asked about this, I was really honored, humbled, and definitely did not feel equipped to talk about maintaining balance in an unbalanced world. Um, this world is definitely unbalanced. Can I get an amen, right? Um, how do we effectively manage our time, manage our resources to lead the people that you and I lead. How do we do that? Because the world is not promoting time management. The world is promoting that busy is better, that the more you do, the more you accomplish, the better you are. Um, but then why is it that so many of us feel empty, discouraged? We always say we're tired. We don't have enough time. I like to tell um, our people, that's that's usually a common excuse, by the way, where when people say, um, I don't have enough time. I don't have enough tough time. I'm too busy. I'm too busy. The truth is, what we should be saying is, I don't take enough time. Because the fact is, we all have 24 hours, right? I've got 24 hours. You have 24 hours. I was thinking about this today. My dad um, was in a rehab facility and he got to come home today. And he'd been there for almost two months. And so he said, man, time flies. Hadn't it flown for you? And, I'm, and I thought to myself, well, no, it hasn't flown for me. But don't you feel like that, that sometimes... Time just goes by so quickly. If you're a dad or a mom, you understand this. The children grow so quickly and you're like, where did the time go? But reality is, let's, let's stop saying that because reality is we all have the same amount of time and it moves at exactly the same speed. So what we're really saying is that 
we haven't done a great job taking advantage of the time that we have. We haven't prioritized correctly. We haven't maybe even done some of the most meaningful things. And so as I was thinking about this, how do we maintain balance? How do we do that? Here, here, I just have a couple of thoughts for you. I'm a pastor, um, so you're probably expecting me to be get real preachy and, and on Scripture. And man, I love the Scriptures and God's Word. But I, I wanted to be real practical because maybe you're watching this and you aren't a pastor or you aren't a ministry leader and you're trying to figure out how to lead people in this way. So I just wanted to give you a couple of things that really spoke to me and have helped me along the way is number one, when we're talking about organizations or churches or businesses, um, you need to identify your mission. And, and a lot of organization and, and ministries and churches and businesses already have these missions for you. So that may not be a hard thing to do. And you say, Chris, that sounds really simple. But I think it's very important that you know why you do what you do. Um, if you are a pastor, I'm a pastor, right? So I need to know the mission of what I am doing. I need to know the mission of Vision Church. And, and as a pastor, you need to know the mission of your church. And I'm not talking about personal mission. I'm talking about your organization, your church, your business mission. So identify that. And that needs to be on the forefront of your, your brain, your lips. Everything you do, you think about your organization needs to be about the mission. Okay? Now, the second thing that I, I think will help you prioritize and maintain is to do that, is to prioritize your time based on your mission. Okay, so what does that look like? Um, practically speaking, number one, physically make a list of everything that you do. Now, I'm not talking about I'm taking the dry cleaners and I've got to go, you know, pay this bill and I, and I, I got to go to dinner. I'm talking about as a leader in your role, in your job, what are the basic job descriptions that you do? What are, what are the tasks that you do? OK, I'll give you an example. Um, so as a pastor, these are the things that I would physically write out. And I want you to do that. I want you to take a list, take time. You don't have to make more time. Take the time to make the list. So um, what I would say is um, I uh, develop leaders. Um, I, I have Sunday messages, right? So our church has Sunday messages. So um, that's a pretty big important thing that I do is work on those, prepare those. Um, I, I develop our staff and our leadership. Um, I, I help lead the direction of the church, um, in fact, I would say that's probably one of my main uh, roles as a pastor. Um, I uh, meet with people. I counsel with people. I study. I do hospital visits. I um, disciple people. Um, right now, um, we are revitalizing the church, and it's actually revitalized. I'm, I'm in, about to enter my fourth year. The church is healthy and thriving, but we are currently looking for staff members, and we need a worship pastor. Well, I have my hands all up in the worship um, ministry. Um, I, I have to do social media stuff. So these are kind of the basic functions, roles of the pastoral. So what you need to do is take some time and write out um, the, the roles that you as a leader in your organization have. Okay, so do that. Okay, here's the second thing you need to do is divide those roles into different categories. And I would say there are definitely um, three, maybe four categories that you need to divide them into. And here's what they are, okay? Um, here's the first one. Look at the roles you have and decide what do you do that only you can do that is vital to accomplishing your mission. What do you do that only you can do that is vital to accomplishing your mission? So, for example, if social my social media is important as a pastor and I need to put that out there, well, that's probably not vital to the mission of our church. Our mission is to love Jesus, love people, and live our purpose. That's the mission of Vision Church. But what is it 
that only I can do that is vital to the mission of our church. And for me, it's only a couple of things to be real honest with you. Sunday messages, and the truth is, we have other people who can, who can do that as well. But Sunday messages and leading the direction of the church. I, I, don't, I don't think anyone else, I know no one else can do that. That is my role as a pastor. Um, well, Chris, what about visiting people in the hospital? Yeah, but can't other people be trained? Do, do you, in your organization, um, do you have somebody you can develop to do these things? This is a lot that I do, and there's only so much of me to go around, right? So what I need to do is identify the top level, the top things, and I would say two to three things that you do that only you can do. If it's four, okay, I would say no more than four. Um, I don't think you can lead effectively and maintain that balanced light if you have more than 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 four things, okay? So that's the first thing, um, and, and, and look, I tell you what, leaders, especially if you're a doer, you're going to struggle with this because you're going to think the more you do means the better you are and the better leader you are. But that's a lie. It's not how busy you are that matters. It's how much of the things that you're doing that actually matter. See, I could be doing a lot. I could be busy, 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 but not effective. And so identify the few things that you do that only you can do that are vital to the mission of your organization, the mission of your church, or the mission of your vision. Okay, here's the second category. What do you do that's very important, maybe even vital to the mission, but other people can do it. Now, maybe they're not ready to do it, and maybe they need developing, and maybe they need training, but what are the things that you can hand off to other people? And look, as a leader, that's hard because you get in the mindset that only you know how to do, and you know what to do the best and the right way, and if it's not, but listen, as a, as a pastor, can I tell you what that's called? Pride, pride, and that's the quickest way to crumble personally and crumble in your organization and in your leadership. Hand off things, develop people way more than doing processes. Develop people more than you do. And I think that's a huge thing um, because we need other people to help us live a balanced life. We aren't meant to do this by ourselves. No successful person, no successful person has built an empire, has built a church, has, has built a great business without the help from others. So as leaders, we need to be developing leaders. So what are the things that you're doing that may be vital to your mission or may be very important that you can start handing off. And then the last category, what do you do that is the lowest of priorities that really, really, if you just boil it back, they're not really encapsulating your mission. You could probably swing it, but it's not vital to your mission. It's not vital to your ministry. Look, the online demand push for the church world has been huge. And, and we went through a season where we were really focused on online ministry, and it's important. But I'm telling you, if I don't pastor these people that are here, if I don't shepherd the flock, then I'm failing. Maybe not by the world standards, but I'm failing by Scripture standards, by the Lord's standard. And so um, what are the things that you can get rid of? And you got to let go. You have to let go. And, and I will say this. If you're doing things that demand a response, in other words, if you're doing things because people have asked you to do them, you need to stop. Um, as a pastor, this is hard. 
I get emails. Uh, people want to meet all the time. People have questions. They want answers. People have what they would say are emergencies or dire needs, and, and, and they come at me. It's, it's, you can tell that it's priority. Pastor, I need to speak with you right away. Pastor, I need counseling right away. There's a, there's a couple that wants me to marry them in two weeks. I mean, and they're just telling me. They're just telling me. And, and that puts pressure on me because I love these people and I want to help them. I want to, but I have some standards and I have some things that must be done in order for me to marry someone. And one of those is to go to counseling with me for, for at least four weeks, um, four different sessions, and we can't pull it off. But there's pressure for me to fit it in to my schedule. Even as I'm talking to you, there's pressure here, right? And let me say this. I heard this, and I think it's really good. Don't put so much pressure on yourself because of someone else's priorities. Don't put so much pressure on yourself because of someone else's priorities. And we do this all the time. Someone else's emergency is not your emergency. It doesn't make it urgent. And you gotta be, you be released from that. And so look at the things that are causing you to be busy and unbalanced. Um, and, and what are those things that you just need to eliminate? Because there are some things. You can also hand some of that off but some of the stuff just really needs to be eliminated. And I want to, I want to share this. Now, that's talking about your organization, um, your, 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 your group, your, your church, your business, right? But let's, let's get a little deeper. Before you can do this corporately, you got to do this privately. You've got to do this personally. So I ask you, what's your mission? What's your mission? As a follower of Jesus, my, my mission is to know and worship God and make disciples. That's my mission. I'm a pastor. That's kind of what my calling is and my job. But my mission, why I'm here on earth, is to know and love and worship God and make disciples. So I have to prioritize what I do. I know that my time with God should be one well, of the first category. That's vital. Everything else, including my family, including my job, including my hobbies, everything else falls after that. So I need to look at my time. Am I spending enough time thinking, being, and knowing, and loving God? Am I spending enough time in his word? Am I spending enough um, moments worshiping God with the way I work, with the way I'm a husband, with the way I'm a dad? Because I can worship God and still live on this earth. Worshiping God is not relegated to just coming to a church service and, and just being still and singing songs and hearing a message. Message Worship is a way of life. It's sacrificing everything I have, giving to God, putting my yes on the table and saying, here it is. What do you have for me today? If I want to be balanced, if I want to be at rest, if I want to be filled with peace, then I have to abide at God. And God, that's what the scriptures tell us, to abide in Jesus. And so I prioritize God. I prioritize family. And I, and, I, and I make a list and I have to physically determine what time, how much time is each getting. It's hard with work, isn't it? Because your work takes a lot of your time. So when you are with your family or when you're with God, or when you're resting, you need to be intentionally focused on those things. And that's what I would say. Take time to rest, refocus, and refuel. You want to know the reason 
that so many of us are tired today, overwhelmed, overworked, we're burdened, there is no balance, it seems like we can't get ahead. Do you wanna know why? It boils down to this. We are not resting in Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Jesus says, come to me, come to me. And Jesus doesn't say work hard. Jesus doesn't say, listen to more podcasts, read more books, study more, do more devotions, um, take care of your family. Jesus says, do you want rest? Come to me. Everybody who's got burdens, everybody who's, who feels like they're too busy, they're unbalanced, they don't know how to lead well, just come to me. Come on. Okay, Jesus, I'm here. What do I got to do? Come on, come on, come on. You just have to come to me. Yeah, 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 but what do you want me to do? Do you want me to read it? What scripture do you want me to read? What do you? No, 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 no. Just come to me. What do you mean? Well, just come. But then what do I have to do? And we get this Martha attitude, right? Remember Mary and Martha? Mary sits and listens. Martha does. And both are good. We should work hard. We should serve hard. We should lead people well. But more than anything, we can't miss the bigger thing. To sit at the feet of Jesus and just be with him. Because when you do that, you'll find the rest that you need. You'll find the balance that you need. You'll find the peace and the comfort and the joy that you need when you rest in Jesus. Hi there, I am Dan Ermler and just wanna say how excited I am to get to share this session with you. Uh, I'm not sure if you're watching this live uh, through the summit or if you're watching it on a replay. Either way, my hope is uh, this can be a benefit for you. Uh, when Justin uh, first talked to me about what my session topic would be on, I was kind of like, man, um, man, it kind of sounds a little bit like a Debbie Downer. We're talking about burnout. You know, we could talk about some exciting things uh, around moving forward, but the more I thought about it, I thought, man, um, there have been a lot of seasons in my life where, um, for whatever reason, uh, I felt incredibly burned out. I'm one of these people, uh, again, if you, if you know me a little bit, I love to go 110 miles an hour and I'm constantly overextending myself. And I've kind of done this forever since, since college. Like I was talking to some other guys about college this morning and I thought, man, I was that guy who tried to take like 18 credits and also work a full-time job. And, uh, you know, it was always this thing of go, go, go. And uh, what I want to do in today's session is really talk about um, uh, how you can really overcome burnout in your life, having come from somebody who has, um, whether it's in my work life, I've owned a couple of businesses, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, you know, I got married early. Within six months, we had our first kid. Uh, um, I have um, four going on six kids. Uh, we have twins being born uh, in about a month, so it's crazy. And this topic really kind of hit me because the more I thought about it, the more I was like, man, this is something um, God's really helped me overcome, uh, has helped me really grow in. And uh, so I'm pretty excited today about talking about burnout and really around creative burnout. So um, let me kind of just jump in and uh, we'll kind of take it from there. So first off, it's creative burnout. Uh, and again, I don't know what your role is specifically uh, where you're coming from. Uh, but there's probably been some moments where you have felt overwhelmed. And my hope is through this uh, session to give you some tips and the ability to really kind of work uh, through some of that. And uh, I want to make this a little bit personal, a little bit interactive. Um, uh, uh, as far as going through it, I will be sharing some stories and uh, we'll be going through it. But before I get too far into it, I do want to um, show you a picture 
and I want to try to keep you to the end. So I'm going to show you some skis and I want to tell you about how these skis made a huge impact in my life when I was feeling incredibly burnt out and wasn't sure. And in those moments of burnout, maybe you're like me, uh, I found that I can make really bad decisions uh, when I'm feeling completely overwhelmed. And uh, I, want to, I want these skis to kind of point your mind because they're, they're a big moment in my life uh, that helped me understand um, how to overcome burnout. So let's keep going. So first of all, my name is Dan Ermler. I'm the director of product over at Tithely. A couple years ago, uh, I sold my company to Tithely. I've uh, been there for about the last three years. Get to help manage the whole product team. Maybe you use uh, some of Tithely's products. We help churches with their giving, uh, as well as our websites and apps and a lot of other stuff. We just love it, love coming in. Got a great team over there. We get to um, come in just daily and serve and love on churches. And that's just the highlight of my life. Uh, now I will say, um, I started my own business really early on. Uh, so when I was about 19, uh, I started uh, a company called Pro Church uh, that helped churches uh, with their design and media. Um, and then about 23, I got married and that's where really things kind of kicked off uh, with a company. So I was newly married. And again, I mentioned about six months into our marriage, uh, I found out my wife was pregnant. In the middle of that time, uh, we were also uh, in the remodeling a home. And I can remember in those moments feeling incredibly overwhelmed. Here I was this young guy biting off way more than I can chew. And uh, I, I remember those moments and just thinking, man, uh, I'd go and I, 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 again, early on when we were remodeling this house, we thought uh, it was gonna be a great opportunity to kind of me and my wife to do it together. And uh, her being pregnant, um, that morning sickness uh, did not work with that. So I'd go and I'd go to work uh, trying to get this business up and going. And then at nights I'd go over to this house and I'd try to remodel. And I just remember in those moments feeling completely overwhelmed. It's really, um, a journey. I, I'm not going to tell you uh, that, you know, there's this moment of complete clarity and that's when I've learned about burnout. You know, at, at 23, uh, I think God was really working in my life to overcome a lot of pride uh, and just the willingness to say, okay, Dan, um, God's sovereign. He can work everything out. And um, what I need to do is trust him. And uh, if you're feeling a little bit burnt out, what I want to say is I've been there too. Actually, when I look into um, the Bible, I see a lot of people who've actually been burnt out. I think of David. I mean, if you go through the Psalms, you see someone who, yes, uh, knew how to worship God, but there's also some deep moments. It was, he was running from King Saul in the backside of a desert, hiding in caves. Here's a guy who was overwhelmed. And I uh, look at Noah, you know, you think of Noah, you know, he built an ark and then he got drunk. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of work and um, he was burnt out. And then we look at Elijah. And so if you're sitting there today and you're like, man, I'm tired and I'm overwhelmed. I have it. Thank you for dropping in. My hope today is that I can let you know you're not broken. There's not something wrong with you. It is human to have times where you feel overwhelmed. Okay. Um, I remember my life, uh, again, I was sharing that story uh, about early on, and again, uh, part of it was just, I always was kind of biting off more than I could chew. And uh, uh, it's funny, I look back, and um, if I would put it in the terms of like a bank, you know, can you imagine someone going to their bank and constantly overdrawing their funds, right? Always using more credit. We'd look at that person and say, whoa, stop. But what we can often do with our time and our energy is we can always be overdrawn on it. And that's something that I realized about my life is that what I was willing to do was just always be making commitments, always be uh, uh, adding the next thing on. And that led to a lot of just life burnt out. Um, Man, I want this. I want this to be a um, a helpful session, and uh, I want to share some personal stories with you. Just just going through, and um, again, I think the personal stories will lead to kind of some of the personal victories. Um, God has really done a work in my life. Um, one of the things that happened uh, about four years ago now is I literally thought, you know, after um, running my own company for about ten years. Um, you know, going into some tougher times just with the staff financially, um, you know, trying to pay the bills. Um, we didn't have a big team, but there's probably about 12 people there. I remember one month, I mean, we just had a tough, it was one of those five week months. And I remember, you know, we came into the office with the account and we weren't going to be able to pay everybody all five weeks. I remember having to sit down with some key people there and just asking them if they would take, you know, on a five week month, if they would miss a paycheck. And I just remember... That, that got me, you know, having to sit down with the guys and saying, hey, would you miss a paycheck? 
And um, it was about that time where I was just, I couldn't sleep. Um, I was stressing out. Um, I, was, I was gaining weight like crazy. And one night I was in, I was, you know, it was, it was about nine o'clock and I was laying there in bed. Um, and uh, actually I had laid down because I started to feel my heart kind of racing. And I had one of those um, Fitbits at the time. And I thought, man, um, I can't get my heart to slow down. And so I thought, man, I'm just gonna rest for a little bit and it's gonna be okay. And uh, what happened was I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And I remember my wife kind of came in and she said, hey Dan, you okay? And I said, um, I, I think so. I just, my heart, I can't, I can't, I can't get it to slow down. And it just, it's just, it, it's just going. And uh, she said, okay, well, we'll kind of keep me knowing, no one's, no one's going on. And at that time we had, uh, we had four kids. So we had little kids kind of running around. They're kind of looking at me and saying, daddy, what's up? You know, they're wanting to bounce around. It's the end of the day. They're kind of wanting to have some fun. And uh, I remember walking and I just could not, I mean, my heart rate started going up and up. And I told my wife, I said, I, I probably, I probably need to go to an emergency room at this point. And she kind of looked at me and I said, I, I really cannot get my heart to slow down. And so um, now my sister-in-law had lived just down the street and I literally, we had to tell my oldest son, Jack, who was probably six at the time and say, hey, you stay here. Your uh, aunt's gonna be here in about five to 10 minutes, but me and my mom, we have to, we have to head to the hospital. We have to go to an emergency room. It was that night, uh, we rushed off to an emergency room. They hooked me up to an EKG machine and uh, I literally thought I was having a heart attack. And it was just this amazing amount of stress and pressure. And it was that moment, I was probably at the crescendo of my life of feeling completely burnt out. Like completely, completely burnt out. And I remember the doctor kind of looked at me and said, hey, your heart's fine. He said, but what else is kind of going on in your life? And I kind of said, well, you know, I'm, I've been trying to run my own business for a while. I've been, uh, you know, we, a lot, lot of things happen in there. And he said, yeah, you need to, you need to slow down. And um, that was one of the moments that God really used in my life to help me understand, okay, how do I tackle this thing of burnt out, of being burnt out and feeling overwhelmed? And, um, and it really was, it was, it, again, God's plan for our life is not for us to be um, stressed out and overwhelmed. I think about Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, where it says, come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I, I think me, now looking back, is I was trying to, you know, I, I, you know, I was, I was someone who, who, you know, I could, I could throw anything on the plate and I just kept adding. And what God kind of taught me through that season is, first of all, if I was going to deal with this thing of burnt out, I had to keep my eyes on you. Now, I know you're here at the Sunday You Summit, so I'm assuming you're a Christian. I'm assuming uh, you go to church. And uh, again, I want, I, want, I want you to know that, um, again, burning, uh, dealing with burnout, there's some practical things we do, but it also is just a spiritual thing. It's really saying, hey, I'm going to cast all my care upon him for he cares for me. And so before we kind of go into all this, and I want to get some practical tips on you know, how I learned to kind of deal with some of the burnout and uh, again, give some personal stories because honestly, I'm not sitting here like, man, I've never dealt with burnout. I can't believe you are sitting there. <laughs> like, who are you? No, it's real. All of us are going to have times in our life where we just, for whatever reason, whether it's projects or people or things in our life, we're going to feel very overwhelmed. Um, but as a Christian, it really starts with understanding, okay, Christ, God has something better for me. And if you're there today, my heart goes out to you. If you're sitting here, you're just saying, I'm stressed. I'm stressed. I'm overwhelmed. It's, it's hard to find clarity. I feel, I feel like there's a lot of things just kind of hitting me. So what I want this session to be for you is, um, my hope is it's a, it's a, it's a burden lifter. My hope is by the end of the session, you're, if you feel like you were treading water, maybe even sinking a little bit, you're like, okay, I, I have my head above water. I'm, I'm taking some steps in, in the right direction. Really that moment for me of being hooked up to an EKG machine, it put a lot of things in perspective for me, put a lot of things that, Hey, you know, maybe I don't have to run my own company. Um, maybe, maybe I should think about doing some things differently. Um, and so what I hope is this session for you, if you feel like you're treading water, if you feel like you're overwhelmed, if 
if you're coming out of season or you're going into a season where you're just like, Dan, I, I got a lot of things on my plate right now and I'm trying to juggle everything. My hope is this session really is um, kind of like a buoy, a burden lifter, something that would help you, gives you some practical tips to be able to overcome you know, burnout. So first of all, let's look at some symptoms of burnout. Maybe you're sitting there saying, Dan, I don't know. I'm not where you were at. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't feel like I'm having a heart attack and I'm not hooked up to an EKG and I'm glad. You know, That was a very scary moment. I had four small kids. I'm, my wife is flying down. She's driving. I'm over there looking at this Fitbit saying, oh my goodness, I hope this thing's broke because if it's not, my heart is not doing well. So I, I'm, I, I hope you weren't in that moment. Um, but um, let's look at some symptoms. Uh, I know sometimes I can have kind of this low grade um, feeling of burnout. And this is some of the ways I diagnose myself now. So first of all, uh, man, I'm, I'm tired and I'm overwhelmed, right? I'm consistently or constantly tired and overwhelmed. And so maybe for you, are you feeling just tired? Just, um, you know, you think about when you started your job, you know, I, I love this. I get to, um, I started my job at Tidely about three years ago and you know, it's always a joy. And, and since then I've gotten to hire people and it's always neat to see those people come in the first, first couple days on the job, first couple of weeks, you know, they got to kind of have that honeymoon period and they're excited to be there on the job. And then I can also tell the people, uh, you know, who've maybe been there, they're great people, but they've maybe gone through a heavier season, a more intense season. And I can tell they're a little bit tired and a little bit overwhelmed. And maybe that's where you're at, uh, at your job. Maybe um, when you're looking, or maybe it's not just in your job. Again, this could be bigger than just your job. Maybe it's, uh, again, it could be a, a conversation, a person, a, a thing happening in your life that's just causing some burnout. And um, so one of the ways I, I kind of diagnose myself is I'm just tired. Am I just, do I not just have the energy to kind of kind of push through? So that's that's really something. Do I, do, I, do I have a fervor? Do I have an excitement? Or am I tired and kind of feel overwhelmed? Uh, again, like I'm kind of treading water. Um, do I feel detached from my responsibilities, right? I don't really feel like I'm, I can take ownership. I feel like I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a spectator viewing in my responsibilities. Again, burnout applies to a lot of our lives in a lot of different places. It could, um, it could be our, our work life. It could be our ministry. It could be our personal relationships. And, and maybe you don't feel that personal responsibility. And it could, again, it could be in your marriage. Um, could be could be with your spouse, could be with your kids. You're just feeling burnt out. You're not, you're not, you're not feeling like the personal responsibility to really um, connect with your children or connect with your spouse. Uh, this is a symptom of burnout. Um, so detach from your responsibility. Maybe your position and maybe some of the projects you were supposed to get done at work aren't happening. Uh, again, this is an indicator that, man, you're, you're maybe feeling a little bit burnt out. Um, and maybe no feeling of accomplishment. Do you feel like you're getting th some things done? I know, I know for me sometimes, uh, just, just pushing through some things, I, I, can, I can feel like, man, if there's been a couple weeks or a couple months, I don't feel like I've really uh, done anything to get, the, get a goal or, or get something across the line. This can, this can be an indicator that, man, maybe I'm, maybe I'm burnt out. If I feel like, man, I'm, I'm not accomplishing what I should be accomplishing. Okay, so those are some symptoms of being burnt out. Now, if you go through that list, you're like, no, Dan, I, I, I feel pretty, you know, I feel like I have some energy. I feel like I'm taking responsibility. I feel like there's some ownership in my task. And I, I'm feeling like I'm getting some stuff accomplished. Well, good. You're probably not burnt out. So um, again, uh, you're probably in a good place. But what I want to do next, which I think is important, is I want to talk about... Um, uh, I want to do a little bit of an action step, okay? So you kind of know, okay, here's some things that maybe you are. Uh, maybe you're on the other side and you're saying, no, Dan, I actually do feel a little bit tired. I feel worn out. Okay, here's what I want you to do next. And this is where the, the interaction kind of kind of takes place. And what I want you to do is maybe take out a piece of paper, open up a note, uh, just take a minute right now, and I want you to list out all the things that are overwhelming you. I, I literally, if you went into my reminders in my Apple, uh, Apple reminders, I literally have a, um, a task list that says what's weighing on my mind. And because my brain has this amazing ability at four o'clock in the morning to ping me and say, hey Dan, have you thought about this? You know, did you remember to pick up the paint? Or did you remember to turn off the light? And uh, sometimes it's bigger than that. There's bigger projects or things that you need to get done in the future. And so I have this thing that's called what's weighing on my mind. And what I want you to do right now, if, you were, if I was going through that list, again, you may be the person who's like, no Dan, I'm not struggling on nothing. But if any of there, you're like, no, I, I have been tired. I don't feel connected to my work. I, I don't feel like I'm accomplishing things. Then here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a minute and just list out all of the things that are weighing on your mind. I, I want you to do that right now. So um, we're going to use this in a little bit. So again, take a little bit of time 
and just sit there uh, and, and list out one or two big things. Now you may not have time to write full sentences, so maybe just put, man, uh, it's this project at work. It's, you know, there's somebody I need to go talk to and I haven't done it yet and I'm pushing it off. I have those in my life right now. There's two or three conversations uh, I need to you know, schedule lunch, get an appointment with, and I haven't done that. Maybe that's you. So you may say lunch with or you know, conversation with this person, but I want you to list everything that's kind of weighing on your mind because we're actually gonna work through that in a little bit. So that's a real big deal. Okay, let's keep moving. Something I've noticed with burnt out is we, we need to stop using the word burnout as a label to generalize our life. I see this a lot where people, um, I just feel burnt out, right? Instead, let's focus on the things that are causing us to feel burnt out. So that's the whole idea of this action step. And again, I'm hoping you're filling out a couple things. It's to, um, don't just don't just fall into this mode of, ah, man, I'm feeling burnt out, so it's time to, you know, it's time to go out and get the big thing of ice cream and Netflix, right? Um, and just kind of escape from all of it because it's just, you know, I'm just feeling burnt out. So I don't want you to use this as a general term that kind of uh, describes your entire life. Instead, let's let's take that list and really kind of identify what are those things that are causing us to feel burnt out, right? So rather than it taking over the whole of our life, it's probably just one or two things. What I found in my life, um, it's often the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. Usually um, for 90% of my life, 99% of my life I enjoy, I, I'm, I'm in love with, I'm thankful for, and it's those one or two things that maybe I've put on the back burner, um, I didn't give it the time and the attention that it needed, and now it's starting to overwhelm me. Now it's starting to feel um, like a chore. And so let's do that. So instead of just, again, looking at our lives and saying, I'm burned out, and turn it into a spaghetti monster, right? Let's try to find the one or two things that, okay, the, this, is, this is a big deal. Okay, so again, I hope at this point you have a little bit of a list. It'll make this next part really helpful. And if, again, if you didn't have a list, just take that top thing. What is the, what's, what's the main thing right now that's kind of overwhelming you? And uh, let's, let's keep going. So let's talk about a burnout strategy. Now, I think there's two parts of this. I'm gonna talk about your work, like what are some strategies we can use at work to kind of overcome burnout, some things that I do. And then what are some personal things? And again, um, I can't wait to talk to you about some of the personal things because that's where um, God has really just grown me. Uh, I grew up in a house that was kind of work, 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 work. And we didn't really, um, when I was growing up as a kid, we didn't really know how to enjoy um, things that weren't work. And so I think there's both, um, I think there's both a, uh, a work, some strategies we can use there to overcome burnout. And I think there's some also some personal things. So I'm excited about this next part of the session. But again, I needed you to, to write down one thing that's kind of weighing on your mind that's, that's causing you to feel burnt out. Rather than generalizing everything, let's just focus in and dial it into one thing. Okay, so first of all, let's, let's cover work-life balance. Okay, so what are some work-life uh, things? What, what, what in our work-life uh, do we need to deal with when it comes to burnout? So uh, this is gonna help me. Let's, let's meet Sarah. She's a fictitious person and she's feeling burnt out. She's kind of nailed down her one thing. She, she was listening to this and she said, man, uh, she's working at a church and she's feeling burnt out because she's been tasked with redesigning the church website. And if you are out there and you have had to ever redesign or redo the church website, you know this is hard. <laughs> so I don't know why. I don't know why it's such a top. It is so hard to redo the church website and uh, Sarah. So what I want to do, if, if Sarah were coming to me and again, we were working through this, I would take her through what I call soon. Okay. I'm going to take her through uh, the soon uh, methodology of helping her kind of work through uh, this. So she doesn't feel burnt out over this project. So let's jump into the S. So S, really I'd ask Sarah, hey Sarah, what does success look like? And she'd say a great looking website that launches in the next month, right? So she's had this website project, it needs to be done. And so what I want you to do is just like I asked Sarah, hey, what does success look like? Take that thing that you're overwhelmed by, right? And I don't know if it's a conversation or a person or a project, you know, something to have to do with your work. And what is success around that thing look like and just jot that down okay so again s stands for what does success look like and for sarah she says i just want to launch a great looking website uh in the next month right there's a tight deadline we need to get it done okay great let's go to o so we're going through soon um oh what are the obstacles and i'd look at sarah okay what are your obstacles and she'd say you know there's too many cooks in the kitchen right this is typical with a church website there's too many people who are speaking into this project right 
there's too many other projects going on at the same time, right? She's maybe a part of the media or the design team of the church, and right? They still have a lot to do on just Sundays and social media, and there's a lot of other things. It feels just like a back burner project, right? This is an obstacle. There's not enough dedicated time to the project and no clear direction and goals of the website. Like what's the website supposed to accomplish? How do we know if it's winning? Is it just the design? And so these are the big obstacles, no clear direction. And if you've ever worked on a church website, you know these are real. Uh, again, I wanna ask you, what are your obstacles, right? You looked at success, okay, what are some obstacles? And I want you to take a minute. Again, this is where it's gonna help you. This session's really gonna help you if you take a little bit of time right now. And say, so what are the big obstacles? Okay, you went through what does success look like? Okay, what are the obstacles you know, look like? What are the things that are really stopping you from getting success? Okay, after that, the next O stands for what are your options? Okay, so with Sarah, I'd say, okay, what are your options here? Okay, we, we can establish or get one decision maker on the project, right? So, right, too many cooks in the kitchen. Let's just do one. We can establish a new deadline and expectations, like how big is this website gonna be? What's gonna get done? Uh, and we can look at getting there more time. So what are the options around this? So options is, oh, the second O. And then lastly, what's your next step? And uh, so what I want you to do is kind of list out, okay, what are some of the options? And, and then list out, okay, what's your next step? So what we just did here was we took this, you know, when it comes to burnout, we often overgeneralize and we think, man, it's everything, it's not. And again, if you went through your list, you have a couple things and you take that top thing on your list and say, okay, let's just take that one thing and let's, let's add soon. What is success to this thing? What are my obstacles around these things? What are my options? And lastly, what's the next step? And for Sarah, you know, go talk to your boss and maybe describe some of these options, you know, and take that next step. And what you're going to do is because you're taking action leads to momentum, right? It's, uh, action creates momentum right? A lot of people say, man, I need to get in the mood to move stuff forward. But if you just take a little bit of action, right, you can work through that. I can't tell you how many times I've allowed two or three projects to kind of load up on my plate. And we've all been here. So, you know, you're guilty. I'm guilty too. Um, and they just suck all the joy, right? There's these two looming projects where if we just kind of take the next step on them, right? We kind of say, okay, what is success? We know what success looks like. What are the obstacles? What's stopping me from getting this project done? Okay, what are, what are the options? You know, what, what's still on the table? And then what's my next step? And that just eliminates burnout. This is something that I use quite a bit at work. It's just, right, when people come to me and say, hey, I have this problem or this issue, or I'm feeling overwhelmed by something, I'll take them through this, right? Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're a boss or you're somebody who has people who work with you, man, this is a great way to help them overcome burnout, right? Help them overcome, help them work through that big thing. Again, if we don't work through it, it's just gonna kind of be sitting there on the shelf, you know, looking at us, you know? Um, how many, when I think of this, a good, a good thing that I think about is, you know, what are those things in the, the house around that you just kind of have sitting there? I think about, um, you know, uh, if you ever go into most showers, and maybe you're a stickler about this, but I can't tell you, uh, you know, you look at like a shampoo bottle or a, um, or a soap bottle and it just stays there forever, right? And it never gets thrown away. Well, that's what we do often with our brains. We have these things that just kind of stay, these projects, because we're not taking action on them. We're not creating momentum around them. And they're just kind of sticking. And so what I'd encourage you to do is take your list, you write, I, I, hopefully you wrote down a couple things and just work through soon on each one of those things. Now, I will say this, you could spend a lot of time um, on your work life. And that's where I was at. I was, I was the person who just, you know, I love to work, I enjoy it. Um, and I'm like the kind of person who can wake up and work, go to bed and work. And um, it's funny, uh, I was out to eat with my pastor recently. Um, great guy, again, we moved out of California about uh, two years ago. And started, I started going to this wonderful church. And I remember sitting down, I just had some things on my mind, some things I'm working through. And my pastor was there um, out, to, out to eat. And he kind of looked at me and said, hey, Dan. He said, you know, uh, and I was trying to, I was like, ah, you know, Jim, I don't, I don't know what to do here. And I, I really need some help. And, you know, I'm trying to figure this out. He said, you know, I, he said, I think I know what you need. Um, and it, it, it's not anything spiritual. <laughs> I was like, okay, well, you know, tell, you know my pastor, you're telling me. He said, you need a hobby, dude. Like, you need a hobby. And I remember sitting there just thinking, oh my goodness, you know, 
Uh, I, I feel like I found some balance in my work life over the last three years. I've really um, gone from feeling overwhelmed and tired and, you know, uh, and there are seasons where I have to go and remind myself, okay, let's, let's stop pushing things to the back burner. Let's just take action on them. Let's use that soon methodology uh, to kind of work through things. Uh, but what I hadn't really done is in my own personal life, really created um, uh, things that I enjoy, these hobbies. And, uh, and again, you may be reverse here. Uh, again, from my background, that just wasn't something we did a lot growing up. But I would say, you know, don't just focus on your, um, on your work life. Also focus on your personal life. Uh, so something that, um, uh, uh, was, that I heard that I love, it's divert daily. I mean, there should be a daily time. And again, this probably isn't Netflix. This seems to be something that's soul, uh, that encourages your soul to uplift. But there should be a, a daily time where you divert. Uh, withdraw weekly. This should be a longer time where you, you know go get away, go have an adventure, uh, go do something new. This is something at 35 that I'm learning uh, to go have adventures. So typically, uh, I'm always kind of like, hey, we got somewhere to be, let's get to the next place. And my wife is so good that when we're maybe in the city, uh, let's just take a little bit of time and you know go find a new restaurant, go find something to do. Uh, go try something new. So when I was sitting there with my pastor and he said, hey, you need to try something new. I said, well, you know, how, how do you, I, it was funny because I'm literally having this conversation about hobbies. And he's like, you just gotta try a bunch of new things, you know? And so one of those things, withdraw weekly uh, and then abandon annually. Uh, so again, if you're gonna feed your soul, if you're going to um, overcome burnout, you know, divert daily. Uh, and again, this isn't social media. This isn't endless scrolling. Uh, withdraw weekly. Go find, figure out you know, if it's hiking, if it's a sport, if it's meeting up with other people. Uh, withdraw weekly and then abandon annually. You know, have those times where you completely shut off, you know, all those normal things and, uh, you know, the work life and really just, you know, shut down and, 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 and recharge, you know, hopefully with the family, hopefully with some close friends, you know, recharge, abandon annually. Um, remember I showed you that picture at the very beginning um, uh, about the skis. Let me tell you a little bit of that story. So um, I, again, God's teaching me so much. But I remember um, we had just moved out here. A uh, big move from California. I, I grew up in California. Uh, you know, um, went to college in California. You know, had our first four kids in California. You know, and about two years ago, God really kind of said, "Hey, it's time to time to move." And so we actually moved to Indiana, and it was a busy season. There was a lot of just in the move in general. Um, uh, getting kids into new schools. It was a massive, I mean, we had spent uh, a lot of time establishing our lives in California, uh, very involved in a church there, and uh, suddenly just kind of picked up, you know, we, you know, we moved. And I can remember I was feeling stressed. I was feeling incredibly stressed. And I was in the gym, I was, we were visiting this new church. I'd been going for a month or two, and there's these people hanging out there, and uh, they said, hey, Dan, um, uh, it had come up that they were going skiing on Wednesday. And I said, um, I said, well, who, who's all gone? They're like, oh yeah, a few other couples. And I said, man, uh, I'd never been skiing. And I said, I, I, do you mind if I, if I go along? They're like, sure. And uh, I remember uh, I was in the middle of feeling stress. And I just knew, I knew that, okay, it's not just, it's not just work. I, this is the point where I had to withdraw, right? I actually had to take some time away. It was my first time skiing and I had so much fun. It was amazing. So much so uh, that the next year I actually picked up passes. And this is me and my oldest son, Jackson, almost every Saturday morning. It's only about 45 minutes away. Uh, me and my son, we go skiing. And that is something that we created so many memories. Uh, I love it. We're planning a big trip uh, next year to go skiing, you know, out in Colorado or in Utah or something like that. But I remember in that moment, um, you know, me and my wife went on that Wednesday. We went skiing. I remember like flying down, you know, flying down a mountain. I just loved it. And thinking, man, this is recharging me uh, in, a, in, a, in a neat way. Um, so again, if you're, if you're sitting there and you're, you're burnt out, Sometimes it's dealing with the work, right? It's trying to get a handle on work and that's part of it. But also it just may be, you need a life-giving hobby. You need a life-giving, something that just recharges you, that you enjoy. This is something that uh, me and my wife have just found it's important uh, that we have things in our life that recharge us. Um, one of the things that I also enjoy is photography and video. And over the last 
a little bit I haven't been doing as much. And just recently, I was picking out the camera, uh, getting the lenses out, and you know, having a good time with some of this. And uh, again, it's it's not just creating, getting, uh, it's not just figuring out and work, but also in your personal life. So again, uh, maybe get a hobby. You know, if you haven't really taken time, maybe um, get that thing that really you can uh, you can put time and energy into. That'll just kind of lift you up. Okay. That's kind of it for this session. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me uh, and talking about uh, burnout. Um, uh, again, uh, if you're sitting there right now and you're, you're dealing with um, a season where you just feel overwhelmed, um, my hope is that first of all, you'd understand that one, Christ wants something better for you. He doesn't, he again, his yoke is uh, light, uh, his burden is light. And he doesn't want you to be overwhelmed. That's not his plan for you. Um, and there's just some practicals, okay, in your work. You know, use, list out those things or weigh on your mind. And there's just, you know, take that soon. Say, okay, what does success look like? What are the obstacles? What are the options? And what are my next steps? And then also maybe take a look at your personal life and say, hey, man, are there life-giving activities? I know it's so easy in this day and age to pull out the phone and do the endless scrolling and, uh, you know, Netflix and just watch some movie and vegetate. But that's not going to give life to your soul. Go find a hobby. Go find something that you can do uh, that makes a memory. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, I'm actually looking at scuba diving here soon. Why? I don't know if I like scuba diving. I have no clue. Uh, but it'll make a memory and I'll be able to try something new. And uh, again, it's something that adds, uh, uh, um, something that helps me overcome that burnout, that never ending, right? Uh, grind that we can so easily get on. So again, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling tired, if you uh, don't feel um, connected to what you're doing, if you don't feel like you've uh, had wins, my hope is this session can kind of help you kind of uh, get out of that and, uh, you know, really um, uh, uh, be exactly what you need to be in your position and also just be enjoying the life that God's given you. Okay. Uh, again, thanks for watching this. Thanks for spending some time with me here and uh, appreciate you and hope you enjoy uh, the rest of the summit. Hey there, I'm Rob. Uh, I help lead the creative arts team at the Summit Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I'm kind of the Swiss Army knife of our team. I've had, got a wide range of skills that equip me to invest in our team, take on special projects that don't really fit with what we do. Um, and so after Justin invited me to speak, uh, I started to think about what are the unique contributions that I could bring to a summit on maintaining balance in an unbalanced world. And I started to think about my story and some of the lessons that I've learned over the years about work, life, and creativity, and pretty much all the mistakes that I've made along the way. And so uh, in this uh, summit, you're gonna hear a lot about time management. You'll probably hear some strategies for getting more done, packing more into your day. I'm here to be the little red guy on the other shoulder to tell you to forget all that, to relax a little bit, and to spend some time goofing off. Um, not all of your time, mind you, uh, but I wanna show you uh, what the world calls wasting time can in fact be the best way for you to re-energize your creative output and increase your productivity. Um, so I never really considered myself a creative person uh, until recently. Like, uh, sure, I did creative things. I doodled in the margins of my textbooks at school. I learned graphic design, photography, video production, and I, I got pretty good at them. Uh, kind of in a, in a jack of all trades, master of none sort of way. Uh, but those things always were a means to an end for me. So I didn't really think about creativity. It's either, hey, I'm doing this to escape from boredom, or this is a byproduct of some other project that I'm working on. So for example, I uh, first picked up a, a DSLR camera when I was a freshman in college, and I had applied to be the section editor for a college yearbook. Uh, and one morning, our photo editor burst into the office. He's like, I need someone to go shoot convocation now. And he throws this enormous camera into my hands. He's like, Lauder, go. And I had no idea <laughs> what I was doing. Uh, I also didn't realize until later I was lugging like $20,000 worth of camera gear across campus. Uh, but I tried it. I ended up pretty good at it. And so I stuck with it. Uh, I served as the photo editor for a couple of years. I uh, shot Wake Forest sports and events and concerts uh, for the Howler for, and the, uh, the yearbook uh, uh, and, the, and the newspaper for a couple of years there. Um, and so the rest of my college years followed kind of a similar pattern. I'd get interested in something. I'd learn how to do it. It would spark another interest, wash, rinse, repeat. Um, 
So uh, five years later, I took a victory lap. I graduated with the most random set of skills you could possibly imagine. Uh, so photo, video, uh, desktop publishing, graphic design, web development, uh, guitar, mandolin. Uh, I spent a year learning and performing magic uh, semi-professionally. Uh, I had a few stage shows. I had a terrible local TV show, which uh, is archived uh, forever, never to be seen again. Uh, my roommate and I became first place league and tournament bowlers. Uh, I participated in mock trial competitions, led a research group from my school that is spun into a market research consultancy, uh, coded my own blog platform before WordPress was a thing, started a gadget review blog, produced a couple of uh, short films. I did all sorts of stuff, gathered all sorts of skills, and I also graduated with a BA in communications, uh, 2.02 GPA, and a boatload of student loan debt. Um, and I also had no idea what in the world I was going to do with my life. Uh, which brings me to my first point. Um, engaging in creative pursuits at the expense of your day-to-day -day responsibilities can do more harm than good. So as we go through this, keep that in mind. That's the context that I'm coming out of. Um, I wouldn't really start to uncover the roots of my unhealthy pursuit of new experiences until much later in my adult life, which I'll touch on at the end of my talk. Um, but I, I could realize and recognize even then that I was using creative outlets as kind of an escape hatch from the real world, world pressures of life. And so after I graduated from college, I decided it was kind of like time to give up my foolish pursuits, you know, kind of get serious, pull on my suit and tie, though I've never worn a suit and tie in my life. Um, and I started to step into the freelance world. Um, so, you know, fresh out of college, uh, obviously with my set of skills, I wasn't exactly employable. And it was 2008 and the downturn of the economy. So I just started freelancing. I uh, started consulting, training right out of the gate, uh, helping companies and nonprofits kind of navigate the early days of the social media boom when things were all wild, wild west and brand new. Um, but eventually they started to ask me, it's like, hey, that's great. I'm learning these things, but I need somebody to help me. Can you provide me services? So that'd be like web development, marketing, et cetera, and skills that I'd picked up along the way uh, that I'd learned in college. Um, and then once I didn't have the capacity to fulfill them myself, I started hiring up a team and I launched a digital agency in 2011. Um, Poured myself into my work uh, and my team for five years. It was five years of hustling, five years of putting out fires, five years of self-denial, uh, doing everything for everyone but myself. Uh, and in that time, my wife and I, we had our first two kids, two incredible little girls. We've got three now to this day. Uh, alongside of this, I'd been serving on the pastoral team of my church. My wife was serving on the worship team. We were leading a small group. Again, all output, no input. Uh, I'm burned out, I'm irritable, I'm angry, I'm unfulfilled, like I'm starting to feel trapped, and I just want to get out. I just want someone to invest in me for once. And so as part of that, we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I took a pastoral apprenticeship at the Summit Church that turned into a full-time job working here as a web developer while my wife got to stay home and uh, raise our little girls. Um, and you know, I started to think that a full-time gig is just going to solve all my problems. It's going to give me more margin. I'm going to enjoy life again. Uh, but it turns out it's tough to make ends meet and raise a family on a single uh, church income. So I get back to freelancing. Uh, so you know, I go from my nine to five, you know, sitting in my office at the church, banging out code uh, from eight to 12. You know, I get the kids in bed and I sit in my office at home, banging out code day in, day out. And like something just had to give, uh, which brings me to my second point. Uh, denying yourself the space to waste time or to engage in create acti creative activities that aren't tied to a work project or some sort of output uh, will lead you to a place of burnout. Um, sure, I was doing creative work, that's for sure, but it was all on client-driven projects and strict requirements and deadlines, and, and didn't, uh, I didn't factor in any margin for play, for creativity, for creativity's sake. Um, and so I, I believe that God gives us seasons like that, these dry seasons, to accomplish uh, two purposes. Number one, to frustrate our plans. And you may say, no, Rob, God's all love. He would never do that. Um, but I believe that God's plan for my life is way better than any plan of my own. And I believe that God's going to put uh, sometimes frustrate my plans until I become discontent enough to ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? How can I use my life to serve you? Um, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and then all the other things will be added to you. The second, he gives us seasons like that to help point us to something new. It's not season by season, it's day by day where we find new morning mercies in God's provision. And so in this season of discontent, I thought to myself two things. One, I need to step away from my desk and get out into the world, get out into God's creation. Second, I need to create the margin to do it, but I didn't have an alternative. So I just like found myself sitting in the status quo. Like I forgot what I like to do. I forgot what filled me up after I'd poured myself out. And I thought back at all these little things that uh, I used to find intellectually and emotionally fulfilling back to my college years, back to, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, you know, hey, I, I used to really enjoy photography. So I went out and picked up a cheap DSLR of my own, started taking portraits of the kids, shooting some nature photos, landscapes, and turns out I really enjoyed it. Um, but uh, not to be content with the dopamine rush of finding something that I enjoy doing again, uh, my brain also thought, hey, wait, you also like making music too. So I picked up an old mandolin that had been in my closet, hadn't played it in years, uh, and dragged it out, fired up some YouTube tutor tutorials, started play on it. Um, never would have broken my status quo if I hadn't uh, found something else to replace it. Which leads me to my third point. Uh, in order to break from your status quo and create that margin, you need to identify something, and that could be anything, to fill that gap. Uh, you won't pick the right thing right away all the time. Uh, sometimes it takes just a spark of an interest, a, a bit of curiosity to point you in the right direction. And then maybe you'll try that and it doesn't stick with, it, with you. That's fine, because likely something else is going to pop up that you can then explore. Now, for me, it's more of a, a merging of interests than it was a, a pivot to something new. You see, I, I, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of the torture that's being stuck in the house with someone who's learning a new, really annoying instrument. Uh, but it didn't take long for my wife to say, it's like, Rob, you need to get that thing out of the house before I go Axl Rose on you and smash that mandolin on the driveway. Um, so I heeded her advice. Happy wife. Happy life. Um, and found a little bluegrass jam uh, that was kind of like designed for beginners and learners to play in where the people there, they appreciated uh, when I played my slowed down choppy fiddle tune on repeat 24-7 uh, uh, because they got to do it too. Um, and so this kind of happy accident accomplished a couple of things in my creative growth. Uh, first, it put me in proximity with like-minded people, uh, some of who were much, much better musicians than I was and kind of challenged me and inspired me to grow. And then second, some of my music friends started to see my photography work and started to ask if I could start taking photos of them or their bands. And so that year I photographed, no joke, 80 shows uh, at least. Uh, and I got paid for around three of them. Um, but I got to meet some of my favorite artists, kind of got it in the inner circle with management teams and then, uh, I uh, get this, there's plenty of opportunities for someone who's pretty good at something and willing to do it for free or next to nothing. Um, but I, uh, I would rather be stuck in the photo pit than stuck in my computer at home writing code. And so lo and behold, I found myself right back in my prior dilemma. Uh, what started as a creative outlet uh, it's, uh, itself turned into its own source of burnout. Uh, I way overcommitted. You know, I was driven by FOMO. I was driven by the excitement of getting the next gig, um, where I could go next. And so I let what was what, what was a source of relaxment and joy become just another stressor in my life. Um, if, if I wanted to keep doing that, I would need to find a healthy and fulfilling way to do so. Uh, which brings me to my fourth point. When I was in pastoral training, we learned the principle intersection over addition. Um, rather than adding new things to your plate, find the intersection of interests and activities that you're already involved with um, and, and help merge those together. So I, I could work or I could play, but I, I couldn't do both. Or could I? Um, so as I started thinking about it, I was sure there was a way to merge both my creative interests and my professional needs like in a healthy way. Um, started to explore the commercial side of music photography, uh, started leveraging some of the time uh, that I spent with artists to ask them questions about the music industry and how media and social media play a role in their success. I uh, looked at the world of record labels, the uh, artist management, publicity, PR. Um, I continued to hold my craft along the way, uh, but I learned that there really wasn't a whole lot of value in live performance photos for artists. Uh, first, unless you nail that one photo that's going to be used on the album cover or in the liner notes, uh, they're really only relevant for social media and even then only for like two days after the 
show. Uh, second, because any schmuck would, with a DSLR would show up to a show and shoot for free, like I was. Um, there wasn't much motivation to hire photographers for live gigs. Um, what we need, they told me, are publicity images. So I learned portrait photography. I learned lights and gels and gobos. I learned that I'm really bad at posing people. I'm more of a documentary style photographer. And so as long as I stick within that realm, I'll do some good work. Uh, but also learned that artists need really good live video. Not only would they use it to critique their performances, but up-to-date live video is crucial for showing booking agents and talent buyers and uh, what sort of performance they could expect when they hired a band. So I went back to my college days, pulled out my production skills, dusted them off, and got to work. Uh, keep in mind now, I'm still working my day job at Summit. I'm doing all this on nights and weekends. My day job gave me that safe harbor to invest in my creative pursuits. Um, and so I was able to take you know, part of the money that I would earn shooting shows and reinvest that into the resources that would help me with the next gig. Um, that could only happen, though, once I had mentally moved on from the self-imposed pressure that I was under to take every gig like my career depended on it, like it was my full-time thing, which it wasn't. Um, which brings me to my next point. Life-giving creativity is found when you engage in projects on your own terms. Uh, because I had started prioritizing joy and fulfillment over work for work's sake, I freed myself uh, to start working only with people who valued my work and I enjoyed being around, and projects that I found challenging and fulfilling. Uh, for the most part, I found a balance uh, that fueled my passion and my creativity while still meeting my freelance goals. Um, but then I, I discovered another side of my creative pursuits, the one that really inspired the idea for this talk, and I think the point that I want to drive home. I discovered that as I engaged in creative projects outside of my nine to five, it started to bleed over to my day job. So not only is my day job setting me up for success in my, my creative pursuits outside of work, those creative pursuits were then fueling my day job. Um, I found that I was able to contribute to my team in new and unique ways as a result of the experiences that I had and the new skills I was learning along the way. I, uh, I developed this new sense of confidence in my contributions to the team, knowing that I demonstrated my value in other areas and wasn't dependent on my teammates to give me validation that in the end only the Lord can give. Um, learning to work with people who are far more talented than I was in any given area of interest um, taught me to be more humble and to celebrate the contributions of my teammates that they could bring to the table, which made me much more of a team player than I had been when I was starving for meaningful and creative work. Um, and all that helped me to improve relationships and find a balance in nearly every area of my life. Um, now, before I close, I want to address one unique thing that I've learned about myself that uh, had I recognized this 20 years ago, it would have set me up for success much earlier in my life and career and would have uh, possibly changed the trajectory of my life. Um, as I've, I've shared my story, some of you might be stuck thinking, as like, hey, that's cool, bro. That's not me. I just want the stability. I want to do this thing. And hopefully there's a principle here that sticks with you that you can take and apply. But a few of you are, are going to be thinking, like, whoa, that's, that's me in a nutshell. Like, I want to address you uh, as I land this plane. So a few years ago, I stumbled across an article about adult ADHD. Um, and I was, as I was reading the symptoms and signs of ADHD, I was thinking to myself, like, okay, check, uh, check. Check. Inability to focus or get started on small, tedious tasks. Check. Uh, tendency to get sucked into hyper-focus and forget to eat, shower, etc. when you're in the zone. Check. Impulsive? Check. Always looking for new, exciting experiences? Check. Self-medicating with caffeine and coffee all the time. Um, and so I sat with it for a while. Um, I endured the emails from our finance department chastising me for forgetting to turn my finance report for the fourth time this quarter. I uh, apologize when I go to the store for my wife and forget the one thing she asked me to bring back for her. Um, but about a year ago, I, I brought it up with, a, with my doctor, and she said, you've got all the signs of ADHD. Uh, she referred me to a specialist who affirmed her diagnosis, and I started to get treatment. And it's absolutely, absolutely changed the way I work in my life. Um, looking back, I can see how so many of the choices, my weaknesses as well as my strengths, were shaped by the way that my brain worked differently than uh, that of other people. Um, so I'm not, like, I'm not angry or frustrated with my, the way that my brain works. Um, in many ways, it's been my superpower. Uh, author Peter Shankman wrote a book about his experience with ADHD called Faster Than Normal, Turbocharge Your Focus, Productivity, Success with the Secrets of the ADHD Brain. And as I'm reading the opening chapters, I'm like, I'm almost in tears because I found somebody who finally like got it and explained my experience to me in a way that I could relate to. Um, I do, however, regret not 
confirming my d suspicion sooner. Um, because as I mentioned, early treatment may, or maybe it wouldn't have, it may have changed the trajectory of my life. So if you're curious, or if you have an inkling that your brain's wired a little differently, um, I'd encourage you to speak to a doctor about that. All right, landing the plane. Um, I believe that the time that we, quote, waste on our creative pursuits can, if we harness and apply them constructively, re-energize the day-to-day -day projects and tasks that we work on back in the office. Um, I encourage my team to take time to just play uh, for engaging in creative projects that um, are entirely disconnected from their job responsibilities because I know that the value of that time will be multiplied when they apply it to other areas of their lives. So what's your creative outlet? Do you have one uh, or do you need to find one? Maybe you've reached the burnout out phase and you don't know where to turn. Uh, my encouragement to you is to fight for margin, to create that time for play and exploration and to put off the guilt of feeling unproductive, knowing that you're investing in a new you and you never know where that next door is gonna lead you. Again, I'm Rob Lauder from the Summit Church. Thanks for listening. All right, that is it for uh, today's free sessions. We, I really hope you got something out of uh, the content today. And thank you so much for joining us. These speakers uh, did this on their, their own accord. Uh, they just love giving this content away uh, for free because they want to help you and help your church. And that's why I love so much the speakers and instructors that are part of Sunday U because they pour so much into this content to help you. Uh, and they really don't get much back for it. Uh, they just truly, truly care for the church and care for you. And uh, we want to help you you know, maintain balance uh, in the world today. And we hope that you learned something today to, to help you along that way, even something that you can implement this week and this Sunday. Um, and we've got a, a ton more for you at SundayU.com. Um, you know, we've got over 300 video training classes like this that you can pick and choose from and watch on demand. Uh, we've got uh, full certification courses from guys like Brady Sharir and uh, Phil Bowdle um, and just walking you through different topics, um, specifically uh, church communications and productivity, uh, YouTube, social media, things like that, and then countless documents and templates that uh, the team has created just to help you make your job easier. We want to take the Things off your plate so that you can really focus on ministry and the mission of your church and not get bogged down um, with all the mundane stuff that needs to be done and and that frankly uh, just doesn't need to be duplicated from church to church like we can we can share some of these resources because uh, they are the same from church to church and you can easily edit them and, and use them in your own context but uh, we work really hard to provide that content for you hope hope it is helpful you can become a member you know, again, use that code SUMMIT and uh, get that first month free and go try it out. You can go download what you need uh, and uh, watch some videos. And um, we just uh, hope it's helpful for you. But thank you for joining us. Uh, we're now going to replay uh, this full summit again uh, for you. If you missed a session or wanted to watch something else again and, and really give it a try, uh, you can do so now. And then uh, obviously this content will, will go away after today, but will still be available at SundayU.com for members. So I hope you give that uh, a try. And uh, thank you again. Uh, love you guys. Thank you for, for watching. And we really appreciate you and what you do for the church. And we're praying that uh, you can continue to really make a difference in what you do. Thanks for joining us. Bye.